and it is our pleasure to invite to the next talk uh, Professor Karsten Meyer, Switzerland from Davos, and Professor Karsten Meyer will uh, talk about his uh, brilliant technique, which uh, which to which he dedicated a lot of time and collected a lot of cases. Uh, thank you, Professor Karsten Meyer, for joining us, and please take a word. I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation, and I have no financial dis uh, interest to disclose. We all know from Jerry Seebeck that the vitreous plays a critical role during the evolution and the formation of vitreous skysis, epiretinal membrane, and macular holes. We also know from Don Guess about the evolution uh, of macular holes in different stages. And Godric showed us very nicely with the in vivo examination of OCT, how macular holes develop. Vitreous plays a critical role. And Robert Mackema showed us that with the release of epiretinal traction and removal of the vitreous, we can close macular holes. After my fellowship, I worked also vividly on vital dyes. So that uh, helped us to release all epiretinal membranes uh, and achieve a nice closure of the macular holes. But wait a minute, did we miss something? If you really release everything from the epiretinal surface, all macular holes should close. But there's a little proportion of macular holes that are not closing. I'm not changing the pathology of macular holes. And we know that epiretinal traction is the main cause of macular holes. And therefore, it's release by vitrectomy, chromovitrectomy will close in nowadays more than 90% of macular holes. However, persisting macular holes, we still treat from the epiretinal side, namely by silicone application, thrombocyte concentrates or ILM patch. We hypothesize that firm adhesions of the retina and the RPE prevent the closure. Thus, subretinal fluid application will release these traction, stretch the retina and close macular holes. This idea is not new. And during my first Gonner meeting 20 years ago, Gonvers, Bove and Thomas Wolfensberger described this technique in a small case series. It took another nine years when a group from Poland published their first case report. And another seven years when Mandelkorn described his technique and named it macular hole hydrodissection. Another group from Canada also described their technique and published a case series where they achieved a nice closure of 16 persisting macular holes, whereas only two macular holes remained open. But these were just single center studies. And the idea was, um, how can we achieve more knowledge about it? At the same time, I did my first case, this technique. This was an 83 year old gentleman who had vitrectomy repeated vitrectomy with silicone oil, silicone oil removal. And now he was sitting in front of me. with a persisting giant macular hole, more than 1400 microns, no ILM pad left for a patch and a really reduced visual acuity. This hole reminded me of my fellowship at Duke when we did macular translocation. So we applied subretinal fluid to release the retina and drag it downwards. And I measured a shift of up to 1600 microns at that time. I'm gonna show you here my video um, of one of my first cases. Um, it's a pretty forward surgery because the eye is already vitrectomized. You can see here the large macular hole and it's easy, easier early on when you apply a little a PFC blab on top of the macula, uh, of the uh, macular hole, because it's easier to detach the retina. 
because you want to have a nice detachment and you want to prevent that early on the fluid goes through the, from the subretinal space, through the macular hole, um, yeah, um, and then you cannot expand it anymore. I was amazed when I observed this old gentleman a week after, or five days after surgery, with the closure of the macular hole, and he um, noticed visual improvement later on of 2200. Was this just a lucky case? And I asked myself, well, is this repeatable, feasible, and what is the risk profile? I presented this at the last bail meeting um, and discussed this uh, intensively with numerous colleagues, including Susan. A novel approach using subretinal fluid may be more effective. It works by injecting fluid under the retina to release the subretinal adhesions between the photoreceptors and the adjacent RPE. First, a small decaline pleb is applied to cover the edges of the hole. Then, three small subretinal plebs of fluid are applied around the hole and the arcades in the macula area. The decaline pleb is now removed by shifting it over the optic disc and aspirating. More fluid is injected into the subretinal plebs, so they become confluent and finally connect with the macular hole. The retracted retina around the macular hole is now detached from the RPE. The elastic retina is now mobile and can shift and cover the anatomical area of the fovea again. After this presentation, numerous colleagues from Germany, Austria and Switzerland contacted me and we started the first multi-center trial evaluating the technique. You can see here that of the 12 surgeons, most apply three subretinal blabs with BSS. They confirmed that it's crucial that really the edges of the macular hole are detached and um, they, these macular holes behave like normal macular holes. So you have a closer within five to seven days. Of these 41 uh, cases, we didn't experience any adverse, serious adverse events, only small subretinal bleedings close to the retina, retinotomy. Um, the as tamponade, most use gas, while a uh, limited proportion use um, silicone oil in their first cases. So what are the results? You can see here 17 months was the average duration of the macular holes more than 1,200 microns um, aperture. We achieved a closure rate of 85% with um, this technique after six weeks. So our con first conclusion was it's feasible, it's easy to perform, it's a small learning curve. We are used to apply fluid in the subretinal space and there's no serious complications. After we have proposed our technique, described it and evaluated the technique in the Apostle study. Numerous other colleagues contacted me um, over the last year. And uh, you also see if you're experienced enough like Makoto, uh, you can also apply subretinal fluid with also decaline, decaline, but you see once you have a connection to the edge of the macular hole, it's gonna stop and then you have to go to another um, location. So if you're experienced enough, you can also think about it. Um, as I mentioned, we have now 44 surgeons, 150 cases. Um, the diameter is basically the, the same uh, 1100 microns. The majority used gas, only a minority silicon oil. However, we now see that not only conventional idiopathic, but also secondary macular holes are um, used in this technique. What is the preoperative um, measures? Again, close to 17 months um, with a logma of 1.16, six months, six weeks uh, postoperatively, like in the Apostle study, more than 80% of the macular holes closed. And um, we um, measured a gain of three point line, line lines. Now, we, with this, load of patients, we can start a sub-analysis. Here you see the results of all macular holes and divided into idiopathic and secondary macular holes, you see a difference. 
idiopathic macular holes are going to close in up to close to 90%. This is technique. In secondary macular holes, it's a little lower. But you have to keep in mind, in the idiopathic macular holes, we had seven eyes with a duration of more than 20 months. So probably the retina was already too stiff to close the macular hole with this technique. And 10 eyes had a diameter of more than 1,400 microns. And we have really to discuss um, up to which um, diameter this technique is feasible. In secondary macular holes, we had 12 eyes with pathologic myopia, six with re after repeated retinal detachment, two after trauma, idiopathic, uh, iatogenic, um, diabetic macular, edema, RVO, AMD, and MACTEL. So I was still amazed that the surgeons reported a closure rate of 60% with these um, included um, uh, eyes. So what can we conclude? We always had a closure rate above 80% uh, in this trial. So four out of five eyes are going to close with this technique. Um, in the late uh, visual acuity, we determined that we will have a gain of 4.9 lines for all eyes, whereas, as expected, it's much lower for secondary macular holes. What can we conclude? Vitreous traction, macular holes developed by vitreous traction and epiretinal membrane formation. A complete removal of the epiretinal traction will close more than 90% of macular holes first step. Persisting macular holes are probably also related to firm adhesions of the RPE and photoreceptors in the subretinal space, and therefore subretinal hydrodissection will release these firm adhesions, stretch the, ret the elastic retina, and close persisting macular holes. There are new other ideas on the horizon that you can combine this technique. So why can't we, after the apostle study, apply subretinal fluid in conjunction with ILM flap formation, and you will hear about this in the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Carsten Meyer. It was a very nice talk. Susanna, do you have a question? I wanted actually uh, to ask about uh, the myopic cases because there, um, Carsten, do you plan now, is this your first approach in a myopic macular hole? In, as you know, most of these cases, we have much uh, less myopic patients in, in Central Europe, in, in Germany and Switzerland, so they were predominantly from Japan. Um, and but I think that it's I was amazed that this technique is also feasible to be applied uh, in myopic cases where, you know, sometimes it's quite limiting, as I showed in my first case, when the ILM is gone. So what so what kind of uh, membrane are you put on top of the retina? Um, um, I know that you can use amnion membranes uh, on top of it, but for me, it's very difficult to harvest them uh, in the private practice. And the subretinal fluid application is, we are very common, we, we used to use it in, well, in macular hole surgery, in, in translocation surgery, in subretinal hemorrhages. So um, we have the equipment, everything uh, we have in the OR. So this is a quick maneuver uh, and it's uh, without any serious complications. I would like to, uh, first of all, to thank you, Professor Carsten Meyer, that he, uh, with his initiative, that he collected so many cases worldwide, because this is a, so uh, quite a rare technique, which is not used oftenly. And only this, this huge amount of cases can allow to analyze this technique and to, to discover the pros and cons and to maybe to uh, think about the improvements of, of the, the still remaining 15 or, or there's a customer. Thank you.
Thank you. I, well, you know, I have to thank you because uh, you sent me also your cases and uh, from numerous colleagues. So this study, also this knowledge wouldn't be available if you don't, if you wouldn't support me with, with all your cases. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think we have another question. No. no. So, but let me ask, I mean, there's, let me ask you one question, Suzanne, because there's always a discussion, can we do harm by applying subretinal fluid? And I know that you did suspension uh, of RPE cells in the subretinal space. And currently I'm working on improvements to detach the retina. Um, I know in the early days when I did it with Cindy Toast, we used the BSS and the BSS plus without it. So do you think, so what is your recommendation as a senior surgeon to detach the retina? Yeah. Well, I, when I detached the retina, I used calcium magnesium free solution. Yes. This was what we had learned that then uh, the, we would uh, be less traumatic uh, for an artificial detachment. And I think it worked well. Uh, but uh, if you overuse it, I have also seen, I think, I don't know who reported that uh, uh, corneal problem. So I think for, for a small amount, you will be fine. Yeah, I okay. also think it's adhesion related, like in a dry AMD to separate uh, the retina will be very traumatic compared to an exudative case. Thank you. Thank you very much.